Hello, it is day one of the week of weird. I'll be vlogging my week so you can follow me along as I read a lot of weird stories. The week of weird is hosted by Crystal at Fiber Artsy and Jason at Jason's Weird Reads, and I will link their channels down below. So what I'm up to today, drinking coffee, as you can see, that is my second cup and full disclosure in a little while, I'm going to be leaving um, and headed to Starbucks for another cup of coffee. And then later on this afternoon, I'm going to be meeting my friend for lunch. So I'm kicking off the week of weird with lots of coffee and lunch with a friend. Now, not only is today the first day of the week of weird, it's also St. Patrick's Day. So happy St. Patrick's Day. So how are my friends and I celebrating today? We're going to eat Mexican food, <laughs> but I am doing something for St. Patrick's Day. I'm going to be wearing some green eyeshadow, and this is from the Absinthe Collection by Beverly Hills, and I am starting off the vlog, and excuse, excuse this hair. My hairdresser has been out of town and I haven't been able to get a haircut, but I'm finally going to be getting one on Thursday. So I don't know what I'm going to have to try to do with this today while I go out. I don't know. I'm going to have to figure something out. I don't know. Anyway, so I'm going to be kicking off this vlog by finishing a book that I did not initially include in my TBR for this vlog. Um, and that book is Gwendolyn Kais, The Haunting of Velkwood. And so I want to go ahead and finish that out. And then the next book I plan to read will be Eric LaRocca's We Can Never Leave This Place. And that is to fit the prompt to read from an LGBTQ plus author. So I am, as I said, just kind of getting ready to go to lunch with my friend uh, after I go to Starbucks and read for a little while there. And I am looking forward to seeing what kind of weird adventures I will get up to this week. And I'm glad you're here to follow along. I will check in with you probably tonight and talk about how my day went and talk a little bit about the haunting of Velkwood. See you next time. Bye. Hey, so I'm checking back in. It is about 10 minutes after seven on Sunday night. I just got back a little while ago from having, I would say lunch, but it was a late lunch and just plenty of time to hang out with my best friend. I am drinking more coffee. Yes, this would be technically my fourth cup today. I had two cups this morning at home. And then as you saw in the footage, I stopped by Starbucks um, before I went to lunch with my friend and tried their iced lavender oat milk latte, which I highly recommend. It was so, so good. I got some reading done at Starbucks and then I got some reading done at the restaurant before my friend got there. So before I talk about what I read, uh, let me just show you what my friend got me for my birthday. My birthday is not until April, but she wanted to go ahead and give me my gifts early. So let me just show you what she got me. So first of all, she has been after me to read a particular book and there's no better way than to buy it for me, right? And that book is Butcher and Blackbird by Bryn Weaver. I've seen this and heard a lot about it. And um, like I said, my best friend loved it. So she got it for me so I can read it. And then let me show you what else she got me. <laughs> oh, no. You know, I'm just not always the most graceful. That's for sure. 
thankfully the candle did not fall too far and it's perfectly intact still this is destination paris it is vanilla Ooh, trying to see i don't know if it's going to show very well in the light but anyway it is vanilla and nutmeg and it smells really really good and i know this is not the best lighting but the sun is going down and i did want to check in tonight so excuse the lighting and she got me a soothe and restore mask which i may not do tonight i may do it tomorrow night but i will put that on the vlog too uh, whenever i do it and then she got me a card which i'm gonna keep to myself but it's super cute so that is what my friend gave me for my birthday so the next thing i want to talk about is the haunting of velkwood now this was not technically on my tbr for the week of weird uh, but this would definitely classify as weird so this is a book by one of my favorite authors gwendolyn keist um, I just have to say that I read uh, Reluctant Immortals by Gwendolyn Keist. I uh, can't remember exactly when I read it, but after I got finished reading it, um, I was taking my British Lit seminar class in grad school, and I was inspired by Reluctant Immortals to write my final paper in that course on the marginalization and oppression of Dracula's Lucy and jane Eyre's bertha because in reluctant immortals gwendolyn keist reimagines bertha's and lucy's stories and sets them in like the 1960s to maybe early 70s uh san francisco uh like haight ashbury district and i just loved the way that she gave bertha and lucy more empowering stories so I wanted to take an academic spin on the two characters. And I knew when Gwendolyn Keist had another book coming out that I had to read it. And this one is about this neighborhood that gets kind of trapped back in the 80s. There's this veil that comes down over the neighborhood and those who are in the neighborhood are trapped in and people outside cannot go back in except for our main character and two of her best friends who also lived in that neighborhood but they were not there at the time of this event where this veil kind of came over and froze time really inside of it and i know i'm not explaining that really well but I'm tired and like I said, it's, it's a weird story, but I'm absolutely loving it already. I've got some quotes that I've already written down. Uh, so I just wanna share a couple of those quotes with you. So as not to give any spoilers, but in the book, uh, the main character has gone back into the neighborhood. She's gone in at this point where I am in the book twice. Um, like I said, random people can't get in there but she and her two friends who were able to escape or who weren't there in the neighborhood, even though they lived there, they weren't there when the veil came down. But a couple of things that really stand out to me are in chapter six, this is the quote, the way the people who populate a street can poison it how the things they say and do can seep into the soil deeper than death so deep that no one can ever excavate it so what's interesting to me is that yes you could see this as kind of a haunted house story but it's a haunted suburban area the place itself is haunted and to me the way she talks about how the people who live there can kind of leave these remnants of themselves behind. Then there are some other quotes like that too. Um, 
I'm kind of going backwards here, but chapter three, our neighborhood was never built for subtlety. Every house arrayed in candy colored siding, the roofs with sharp, almost comical angles. We all lived in split levels with the same floor plans, the mid-century equivalent to making it in suburbia. But that dream was a short-lived one. The street was dated, almost kitsch, by the time we started high school. So the idea there again of even before the bell came down, this neighborhood was kind of trapped in this certain time period. And I listened to or watched rather an interview that Jason at Jason's Weird Reads did with Gwendolyn Keist. And I will link that interview down in the description box. And also I will link the article that Jason and Gwendolyn talked about in the video, in the um, interview too, is an article that Gwendolyn wrote about the suburban Gothic. And that article just, it's so uh, like, I don't know. I feel like I'm fangirl in here, but it's so smart. She's so smart. She writes beautifully with her works of fiction, but then in her academic essays or her essays looking at literature, she brings out so many interesting points. And that article really ties in well with the book. Uh, so I'm going to link that down below too. Again, I will try to be a little more coherent in my thoughts tomorrow. I know this was a bit rambly, but again, I'm tired. And sometimes when I get to this point in the day, especially when I've been out and about, um, I start to get a little bit of brain fog going on. But I did want to check in tonight and I will check back in tomorrow. Hey, it is day two of the week of weird and I am currently in my comfy chair the lighting's probably not the best because I'm just recording mm -hmm. with my phone you will hear some background noise because my daughter is home from school today because it is teacher work day so I'll flip the camera around so you can see my sweetheart Rena can you say hey Rena, what are you doing? <laughs> so that is Rena's comfy spot. She loves to get on the floor with her comforter and with that chair. That's her latest obsession. Um, and speaking of obsessions, my latest obsession is The Haunting of Velkwood by Gwendolyn Keist. Excuse this post-it note. That's a uh, little reminders that I need to put into my planner in just a little while. So last night I talked about the haunting of Velkwood. I uh, would probably more accurately say I rambled on about the haunting of Velkwood. Um, and I don't know if I said who it's by, but it's Gwendolyn Keist. And I am still loving this book. Um, I am completely like on a deep dive now of all these interviews and these articles that Gwendolyn gave about um, this book. And I was listening to a podcast this morning called Staring Into the Abyss. I will link that episode down below. And Gwendolyn was talking about one of the aspects of this book too um, is this concept of trauma and how people deal with trauma. So our main character, Talitha, she, you know, over the course of the years that have passed since the incident occurred that veiled her neighborhood off and left it stuck in the past, she is functioning, but like barely so. She just kind of floats from sort of job to job. She's not really, you know, thriving in a lot of ways, more so surviving. And that's just kind of how she is dealing with the after effects of the trauma. And then her, one of her other friends who escaped out of the neighborhood before the veil went down, separating it, um, is 
grace and grace fell apart pretty much immediately after the traumatic event occurred. And then you have Talitha's other friend, Brett, and she has gone on to be very successful and her career of choice. Uh, what she does is basically like flip old abandoned buildings and turns them into something new, something beautiful, something prosperous. So when you think about that in terms of what happened to the neighborhood, it's really obvious that Brett's way of coping with the loss of the neighborhood and the way that it neighborhood where she grew up remains stuck in the past is by taking that trauma and using it to fuel a career that she's passionate about, where she takes these old buildings that have become abandoned or that are seem to be stuck in the past and revamps them so <laughs> that they can be something beautiful. And one of the things too, that Gwendolyn talked about in the interview is how people are going to judge each of these characters and the way that they deal with trauma. It's like there are always going to be critics who have something negative to say about the way others deal with trauma. People would judge Talitha, our main character, because she's just kind of floating from place to place and she's not really, you know, successful in terms of the way that a lot of people would view success. And people would judge her and saying, look, she couldn't handle that trauma. She, she must be weak. And in a lot of ways, that same thing can be said of Grace, who fell apart immediately. People would judge her and say, well, she's just weak. She couldn't handle the trauma. She couldn't deal with it. And then people would judge Brett, who went on to be very successful, and say things like, well, her trauma must not have been too bad because look at her now. She's got money. She's got a lucrative career. So it must not have been that bad. So one of the aspects of this book, too, is dealing with trauma and thinking about the different ways in which people deal with that and seeing how no matter how you deal with trauma, other people are going to judge you. And that's something that I'm also thinking about now as I'm reading the book. Uh, so I'm going to read some more of it today. I need to watch at least one, maybe two movies uh, because I'm excited. I'm going to be on a podcast uh, and we'll be recording that episode this weekend. So I need to take some notes on these movies and I'm excited to be a guest on that podcast. You'll get more information about that later. Um, other than that, I will be hanging oh. out with my daughter and I will check in again uh, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, whenever. But I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>
at the conference a 15 minute condensed version of my master's in English thesis, which is titled Eclipsing the Patriarchy, the Power of Intergenerational Female Connection in Stephen King's It, Carrie, Gerald's Game, and Dolores Claiborne. I am feeling terrified this morning, honestly. This is my first time to present at a conference like this, and this is a national conference, and you can probably even tell in my voice that I'm I'm starting to get very anxious about this. Um, up until this point, as soon as I knew, like several, several months ago, that I would be presenting at this conference, I've kind of vacillated between excitement and nervousness. But today, I just feel terrified. So I was starting to get really anxious, and I thought, let me come on and talk to you all while I put my makeup on and maybe I'll feel better. Um, and I, I try to keep framing it to myself as this is a wonderful opportunity to get to talk about something that I'm very passionate about. And if I look at it that way, I'm hoping that shifts my anxiety back into excitement. Um, but enough about that right now. Other than to say I will be vlogging that trip, so I'll be taking you along with me as I fly to Chicago. And I'm excited about going to the other presentations too. There are a lot of really awesome panels that are taking place uh, throughout the conference um, schedule. So I'm excited to listen to you uh, you know, other presenters too, but I will take you along with me. So yeah, other than that, um, I yesterday watched one of the movies that I'm going to be talking about on a podcast. Like I said, I'll be on a, a certain podcast. I don't really want to say right now, but we are recording that episode on Saturday. So we're talking about two movies and I watched one of them yesterday for the first time. It had been a movie that I'd wanted to watch and I just hadn't gotten around to it yet, but I did watch it yesterday and I really, really liked it. Um, and then I'm going to rewatch the other movie that we're talking about because I have seen it and absolutely loved it too. So I'm going to rewatch that. Uh, probably not today. Today, the main thing I need to get done is to teach my mythology for high school class. Um, and that's a live class meeting so that I'll be on for about an hour um, teaching and interacting with my students. I do have uh, one class that is like pre recorded videos where students watch and answer questions on their own time. But most of the classes that I teach are live uh, classes where we actually have a set meeting time uh, through the Zoom uh, app and talk about our subject, which is today uh, will be my Greek and Roman mythology class. Uh, last night, I did read more of The Haunting of Velkwood by Gwendolyn Keist. I'm about halfway through this book, uh, and it is my bonus <laughs> book for Week of Weird. It's definitely a weird book, like I said, so it fits into that, but it wasn't previously on my TBR that I had planned, so I hope that I'm going to get to the other things. They're pretty short. Um some of the things. So I'm hoping I'm going to get to those during this week. But like I said, I'm feeling the time crunch uh, because I do still need to finish up my slides for my presentation and I'll leave in a week. So that's priority. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the haunting of Velkwood. I can't say a lot this time because since I checked in last time, we had like this major reveal and I was like, what? Oh my God, what the hell? So that was uh, exciting. And then we also had this kind of 
this twist, another little surprise. So I'm super excited to get back to it. And I don't know, like I said, when, hopefully tonight. I don't know if I'll have time during the day today because I do have all of this other stuff I've got to do, like the presentation. Hey, I'm checking in again. It is still Tuesday. It is around 1230, 1245-ish. And I wanted to hop back on just a minute because I got a package just a moment ago. So I wanted to open that. And since I'm only hopping back on for just a minute, I apologize because I did not get out my ring light and I did not get out my mic. So I'm going to open up this package. I know what it is, but I'm excited to get it. <laughs> Trying to be careful with it here. All right. And this is Night's Edge by Liz Karen. I hope I'm saying that last name right. I kept hearing about this book a lot. And then I was listening to the Books in the Freezer podcast uh, from a couple of weeks ago. And Liz Karen was on there with Stephanie. And I really started getting very pulled in extra to this uh, book. Like I said, I'd heard of it before, but that episode they were doing like a playlist for this book. I don't know. It was really cool. I'll have to link that episode down below. But uh, as you know, I've been on a bit of a vampire deep dive. If you followed me here or on Instagram, then you know that I've been very much into vampires. Again, I'll say a vampire deep dive again because I do these probably pretty frequently. But again, I'm excited to read this. I'm not sure exactly when I'm going to get to it. Since this is the week of weird vlog, this was not included in my TBR and I've already gone off record and started with a TBR or with a book that's not on the TBR anyway. But I'm sorry, I'm rambling. I gotta go, I gotta get ready to teach a class in just a few minutes. But I just wanted to say I'm so excited to Get this book, Night's Edge by Liz Karen. I will check back in with you. If I don't get back to you today or tonight, then I will see you tomorrow. I'm still in the midst of reading The Haunting of Velkwood for the week of weird. And the next book I plan to read is Eret Loraka's We Can Never Leave This Place. So I will check back in next time. Bye. See you soon. So it is Tuesday afternoon around 4.45. Tipsy Tuesday, right? Um, no, I just got this one. I'm not tipsy, at least not yet anyway. But I wanted to check back in and say that I'm a little past the halfway point in the haunting of Velkwood and there was another twist and I was like oh my gosh so there's twist after twist that I was not expecting I'm still loving it I definitely feel like this is going to be a five star read for me um I cannot wait to get finished with it but it's also one of those books where you're like you can't wait to get to the end but then you know you're probably going to experience a book hangover when you're done. Um, also, since I checked in with you last, I went outside and did a little bit of reading because I felt like I needed to just get out of this house for a bit. I did have to go to the store, but I just needed to step outside and enjoy the sunshine a little bit. It's been a hectic day. I don't know if I mentioned earlier that I also had to attend an online meeting in addition to teaching my class. And there's a lot of stuff that I'm gonna have to deal with related to that meeting so I'm kind of trying to process all of that I also uh, went on another zoom meeting this afternoon because I mentor uh, grad students so me or I guess I should say the other mentors and I had a meeting this afternoon um, and we had that open for any of the students that needed to come in and get feedback or talk with us. So I've actually had two meetings today. 
You probably hear my daughter in the background making her little happy sounds. And thank goodness that tonight's dinner is leftover, so I don't have to cook. So I uh, also need to be working on my presentation, finishing that up for Chicago because I leave in six days. Um, there are still things I need to put on my slides, but that was supposed to be my priority today. And I didn't even get to do it because of all the other stuff, meetings and classes that I had to teach and go into the store. Mm -hmm. But I teach two classes tomorrow, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. So between those classes, number one priority for me is going to be working on my slides for my presentation. I'm going to try to finish The Haunting of Velcro tonight so I can get to my next read for the week of weird. And that, as I mentioned before, is going to be We Can Never Leave This Place by Eric LaRocca. I keep wanting to say things have gotten worse since we last spoke, which is the only thing I've read by Eric LaRocca. And I freaking love that disturbing story. Um, but I'm going to go now and drink my wine and read The Haunting of Belkwood. I'll check in again. I, probably not tonight. Probably tomorrow. But at any rate, I think I said that before. But um, here I am again. I'll see you next time. Hey, it is Thursday afternoon about two o'clock and today is day five of the week of weird. I did not check in yesterday uh, because I had to teach two classes and then I had two online meetings I had to attend. So there was a lot going on yesterday and I did finish The Haunting of Velkwood just a few minutes ago. Um, in the footage from earlier today, you saw that I got a haircut. Then I went and picked up some breakfast. Um, after that, I had to go do some grocery shopping, which I did not record any of that because it really wasn't that much fun. Um, and then once I got back home, I had some lunch and finished The Haunting of Velkwood. Velkwood. I gave The Haunting of Velkwood five stars. I am pretty certain that it's going to end up on my top 10, maybe even in my top five reads of 2024. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about The Haunting of Velkwood by Gwendolyn Keist. So I mentioned this setup before. You have this neighborhood that has been kind of veiled over so that no one can get in except for these three young women who happened to escape from the neighborhood the night before the veil came down. So this suburban area of Velkwood has been stuck in a time trap where Ever since that veil went down 20 years prior to the current day where we're getting that part of the story, um, nothing has changed in the neighborhood as far as time frame wise. So it really says a lot about the way that suburban areas can be kind of tied into certain time frames. Um, it's kind of hard to explain this book because I don't want to give anything away, but I would say for me, this book gave me some vibes from the movie It Follows. Not exactly the same plot or anything like that, but the idea of trauma following you and also the kind of ambiguous timeline. Because if you have seen the movie It Follows, you know what I mean. You can't really nail down what time period that movie is set in because you have some things that would look more 80s like but then you have uh one of the main characters friends who's got that 
clamshell e-reader, whatever that thing is, right? And you've just got a lot of um, uncertainty about the time period. And so a lot of that comes through in The Haunting of Velkwood also. And then, of course, as I said, dealing with trauma and this idea of can we really escape our past? And even if we do escape the traumas of the past, what may still linger with us? How can we heal from that? How can some people move forward? And why do some people remain stuck in the past? This book also deals with familial trauma and how those in our family can be the ones that can hurt us the most. This one quote in chapter 11 really stood out to me. And it states, family is the ultimate trap. It's something you carry with you for life, the people you come from, and the marks they leave on you. So, for example, even if you've chosen to cut out certain family members from your life, uh, family members who are toxic or family members who are abusive, that doesn't always mean that the marks they leave on you, that that doesn't linger somewhere within you and sometimes can resurface um, depending on what you may be going through that day. And there was another quote too um, that really speaks to the way that trauma can follow us and the way that the past can sometimes creep back up on us even when we don't expect it. And that quote is also in chapter 11 and it states, but you can only escape the past for so long before it comes looking for you. And this book also deals with abuse that takes place between a stepfather and a character and also abuse between a mother and a character. And one of the abuses I would say is more overt, more obvious to everyone. And the other abuse is a little more subtle and can be hidden. And both of those are obviously extremely harmful. And the book also deals with the way that, especially with that young person who is being obviously abused, that the other parents and the entire neighborhood of Velkwood knows what's happening. They see it and they refuse to confront it and how that also lingers and causes trauma for the character, obviously, who experienced the abuse, but also for her friends who saw what happened to her and saw their parents and the rest of the adults ignore it. So this book is very heavy in dealing with a lot of topics that are very serious. So I will encourage you to check content and trigger warnings before going into it. For me, I felt like a lot of it was cathartic and I, you know, I feel like I say that a lot for a lot of the horror that I read that I'm able to process sometimes my own thoughts and feelings and my own traumas through the lens of characters. And I appreciate that, but I know that doesn't work for everybody. So I always want to caution you to check content trigger warnings so that you're protecting your own mental health. So again, The Haunting of Velkwood, five stars. It's, it's one that's going to stay with me. The next book I have for Week of Weird that I'm going to be starting today is We Can Never Leave This Place by Eric LaRocca. So that's what I'm about to do. I'm about to read that. I'm about to make some coffee. The rest of my plans for today are to finish watching the second half of the second movie that I'm going to be discussing on someone's podcast coming up a little bit later. And I need to pack for Chicago. I am finished with my slides for my presentation, but I did send them to a couple of my, uh, what am I trying to say? A couple of my fellow mentors um, I mentioned before. I think that um, I'm in a group of mentors that mentors 
students who are currently um, in their final stages of their master's program. And so I have like peer feedback. So I've got that to look forward to, right? Because I told them be honest, right? I want their honest review. That way I can make my presentation as, as good as it can be. So I've got to brace myself, right, for uh, some conservative, con what do you call that? Conservative, constructive criticism, right? So I'm going to be doing that. And I will hopefully check back in tonight. But if not, then I will check back in tomorrow. And I will see you at that point, whenever that point may be. <laughs> Bye. See you soon. Good morning, Gandalf. Good morning. Good morning. You look very serious. Good morning, Freya. Ooh, your eyes look creepy. Hello. Today is Friday. It's about 8.45 in the morning, and this is day six of the week of weird. So the week of weird ends tomorrow, and I just realized this morning that I have only gotten to one of my four books that was specifically part of my TBR for the week of weird. I did talk about, of course, The Haunting of Velkwood, which I'm calling like a bonus book for the week of weird, because it was definitely weird, but it would fit the category of a book written by a woman. My official book on this TBR for that prompt, though, was Mewing by Chloe Spencer, which I still need to get to. Um, the book that I had for Old Weird, it's really like a short story, so I feel like I could tackle that today, and that is The Sandman by E.T.A. Hoffman. The book I had for New Weird, technically, um, officially on my TBR, is A Short Stay in Hell. And let me look because I can't remember who the author of that book is. I think it is. Okay, Stephen L. Peck. Yeah. So I haven't gotten to that one yet. So I still need to get to Mewing by Chloe Spencer. A Short Stay in Hell by Stephen L. Peck. The Sandman by E.T.A. Hoffman. I am about halfway finished with the book I chose for the prompt to read a book by an LGBTQIA plus author, and that is We Can Never Leave This Place by Eric LaRocca. I should, like I said, be able to finish it today. I'm like on page 50 and there are only 97 pages. Um, I was hoping to find an audio book for this too. That way I could listen to it while I was packing and getting ready to leave for Chicago next week, but I could not find an audiobook available for it without having to pay something extra, which I don't really need to do right now. But when I was looking for an audiobook for We Can Never Leave This Place, I actually found an audiobook for another Eric LaRocca book, and that book is You've Lost a Lot of Blood. So I am listening to that one on audio, because, hey, why not add another extra? I don't think I'm going to talk about You've Lost a Lot of Blood in this video, though, since that would be another book that was not officially on my Week of Weird TBR. So I'm probably just going to wait and talk about You've Lost a Lot of Blood in my regular March wrap-up. But to tell you a little bit about what's happening in We Can Never Leave This Place. If you've read from Eric LaRocca, you know it can be hard to explain because his writing is weird, right? But we're following this character. She's like 15 or 16. She's obviously in this war-torn zone where you have a lot of different um, militia that are fighting against each other. At the beginning of the book, her father has been killed, supposedly by this sniper, when he was going out 
either to try to barter for food or to leave the family. We're kind of led to think one way as far as that goes, but it's not definite, at least not in this point in the book. And additionally, her father's dead body was brought to the door by these guys who were wearing like masks and stuff. And her mother is like keeping her father's dead body. She like cleaned it all up, but it's still just lying there in the house for a while. And then they have like this service and the service is really weird. Um, and if you're feeling confused, I think you're supposed to, because I'm still a little bit confused and I think that's how it's supposed to be. Um, her mother and her, um, our main character, her mother, and she have this really, uh, difficult relationship. I'm trying to think there's a word for it that I can't think of. Dysfunctional. There you go. They have a dysfunctional relationship. Well, in the midst of, you know, the aftermath of her father's death and, the grief she and her mother are experiencing, the conflict between the main character and her mother, this strange guest comes to the door and wants to be let in. Our main character is hesitant, hesitant to let this thing in because it's weird. <laughs> Again, I will say weird a lot, but I guess that's fitting. Um, it's like a creature like thing so she's obviously hesitant to let this uh creature in but her mother insists on letting this guest in and like taking care of this guest and giving this guest what it wants in exchange for the promise the guest makes that he can protect the main character and her mother and one of the blurbs that I do want to mention that I am trying to keep in mind as I'm reading this is a blurb from Paul Tremblay. And Paul Tremblay wrote, We Can Never Leave This Place is the apocalyptic 21st century Grimm's fairy tale you need in your life. Eric LaRocca plucks images directly from the muck and mire of our id and fash fashions them into something grotesquely beautiful. Okay, see, that's another thing about the writing that Eric LaRocca does in this book and in Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke, which is the only other book until now by Eric LaRocca that I had read. But one of the things that stands out to me and makes his writing so unique and so wonderful is the way that he conveys very disturbing scenes with very beautiful writing. His writing is just absolutely beautiful, even when he's writing about the most horrifying things. Um, let me just give you an example, too. This won't be spoilery or anything like that, but just so you have an example of the way that he's able to write these grotesquely awful things with such beautiful words and language. So here's a quote from the first page of the book. There are some recollections of mine with sprawling roots so strong, I can't help but wonder if they're made from piano wire. Even if they were memories I might not care to attend to, like perennials, they bloom every year around the same time. Yeah, see, uh, see what I'm saying? Like this beautiful imagery with like flowers, but mingled in with these other horrific things that are happening. And then he has a way too of just like pinpointing human nature. One of the examples I want to give of that is this quote. There's a language shared between adults that children don't seem to understand. A secret language where intentions are clearer 
and motivations are far more obvious. There were things passed between my parents I was told I would never understand, as if they were secrets from ancient civilizations of how to undo the universe. So, like I said, this book is weird, wild, confusing, but I'm enjoying the ride. (laughs) So, that is what I've gotten up to so far in reading And I'm trying not to feel the pressure since tomorrow is the last day of the week of weird. And I still have three other things I should technically be getting to. While I also have other stuff to do today. Like I said, I've still got to pack for Chicago. I still need to read over my notes. I finished my presentation. I got feedback like I was telling you in the last check-in feedback from a couple of my peers. And that really helped me a lot to kind of adjust things that needed to be adjusted on my presentation. So I've got that done. I need to also make this apple crisp today because I want to have something that we can kind of eat this weekend for breakfast and stuff like that. That'll be easy, already made. And I also have to teach a class today, just one class today. And I don't normally teach classes on Fridays, but I had a request for a specific uh, day and time. So I was able to meet that today. And it's one of my favorite classes to teach. It's a one-time class um, centered on folklore and horror and urban legends. So I've got to teach that today. My daughter and her boyfriend are dropping their two dogs off for me to watch this weekend while they go on a trip. And then when they get back, uh, my daughter is coming to stay here with my youngest daughter so my husband and I can go to Chicago. So I've got a lot of life happening (laughs) right now. And I need to get off here so I can go attend to all these life duties. I may or may not check back in today, depending on uh, how it's going tonight. If I don't see you again today, I will see you tomorrow. Or technically, I won't see you, but you'll see me, right? All right, I'm going to quit rambling and get off here and get busy. See you in the next check-in. Bye. Hey, it's Saturday, day seven, and the final day of the week of weird. It's about 12 o'clock, and I, um, since I checked in last time, I did finish reading We Can Never Leave This Place by Eric LaRocca. I ended up giving this one three stars. I did not enjoy it nearly as much as I did. Things have gotten worse since we last spoke. And so I feel like I probably had unrealistic expectations. This could be on me, uh, but I just, I don't know. It didn't hit me the same way that things have gotten worse since we last spoke did. So to try to summarize what happened and we can never leave this place. Um, In the last check-in, I mentioned that this strange guest had come and insisted on being led into the home of the narrator and her mother. So her mother lets this guest in. Um, This guest is supposed to protect the narrator and her mother in exchange for what it wants or needs. Some really disturbing things take place between the mother and the guest. 
Then we also have some other really strange guests coming in too. Sna a snake, a lizard, then some more lizards and some cockroaches. And all of these creatures do disturbing things to the narrator's father's dead body. And some disturbing things take place between the main guest and the narrator's mother. Some grotesque things happen. There's uh, some cruelty to a pet. So check trigger and content warnings for that. And a whole slew of other content and trigger warnings for this one. So I did kind of see partially where it was going going to go in the end, believe it or not. And by that, I only mean that it was pretty clear that this was a metaphor and that these creatures stood in for something else. And you really get that reveal at the end of the book. There's some other weird stuff related to giving birth and just, I don't know, this one is, is absolutely wild. So if you do go into it, like I said, make sure that you are aware of potential trigger and content uh, warnings. And yeah, that was, you've, uh, no, that, that's, uh, we, can, we can never leave this place. I was fixing to say that's you've lost a lot of blood, which I did listen to on audio, but I mentioned earlier, since that was not a scheduled TBR read for the week of weird, I'll talk about that in my regular wrap up video. But yeah, um, if you like weird and you like disturbing, mix in with beautiful writing because Eric LaRocca still had that uh, going in this book too, then uh, try. We can never leave this place. The next book that I want to talk about is The Sandman. Well, technically it's a short story. So I started listening to that on audio. And so it seems a bit confusing because it's like we had this one main story going then it seems like some other stories are going to mix in with it. So I'm not sure what to say about it so far. Um, but after I finish it, I'll come back and tell you more about it. And that's uh, The Same Man by E.T.A. Hoffman. Other than that, I started reading the book that was officially my prompt for reading a book written by a woman. But I'm going to... DNF it for now and go ahead and switch to the prompt for New Weird, which is uh, I'm going to be reading A Short Stay in Hell by Stephen L. Peck for that. And I feel fine uh, DNFing Mewing because I did use a bonus book for the week of Weird that was written by a woman author. And that book was The Haunting of Belquid by Gwendolyn Keist, which you know that I love. And I just want to talk briefly too before I close about the reasons why I'm just not really feeling compelled to keep reading Mewing by Chloe Spencer right now. So it's got some cringy dialogue. Like, for example, there's this um, statement that the narrator makes. Uh, here it is. $15 a cut was a steep price to pay for a drink. But it was worth it for the gram. I, I just don't, I don't like that. It just feels a little too, I don't know what the word is, but to say the gram instead of Instagram, I just, that bothered me. And then she's talking about not, I mean, she's a model, so I get it. But at the same time, she's talking about needing to get back on her low-cal keto diet and i'm confused by that too because i have in the past done some keto diets and i've also done where you count calories and i feel like those are kind of two different things but again i could be wrong i don't know but that was just like i, I don't know and then one other thing this and this is when I was like, this is like at 11%. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to put this one down for now because I really want to get to a short stay in hell. And this one, this statement is, but she was the snake and the snake could camouflage. So I don't know. I'm just not 
feeling that one. I'm not saying I'll never go back to it, but for now, I just want to move on to a short stay in hell. So I know, like I said, technically today is the last day of the week of weird, but I am going to extend it into tomorrow. So when I check back in next time, I will have finished the Sandman and I will have started reading a short stay in hell. So I'll see you when I check in again. Bye for now. Who's ready to eat? Hey, so it is Sunday night about 8.30. I apologize for the lighting. I have you in the bathroom while I'm taking off my makeup. Um, this was my bonus day for the week of weird, and I'm excited to say that I did finish both The Sandman by E.T.A. Hoffman and, oops, and, uh, A Short Stay in Hell by Stephen L. Peck. So, I know this vlog is going long and it's getting late tonight, but The Sandman, I don't remember how much I mentioned in my check in last time but it's a super short story so you can read it you can read it online for free but anyway we're following nathaniel who is our main character and when he's a little boy his mother will often tell him you know it's time to go to bed the sandman's coming which we were told you know probably a lot of us anyways children and the idea that we have is the idea that his mother tells him that it's just this sand, you know, it's not harmful or anything. It's just sprinkled in children's eyes to help them sleep. Well, his Nathaniel's sister has this nanny and she tells Nathaniel that the Sandman actually sprinkles this sand in the children's eyes that will cause their eyes to bleed. And then the Sandman plucks the children's eyes out and takes them to his nest to feed his baby birds with. So this just puts into Nathaniel's mind this horrifying image of the Sandman. And he can't really shake that image. So when he's in the bed at night, he starts hearing these footsteps creeping up the stairs. So he assumes that that must be the Sandman. Well, his father has this uh, friend who's kind of a jerk to the kids anyway, kind of a scary type guy. And Nathaniel sees this guy like creeping up the stairs to his father's bedroom. So he associates the Sandman with this particular friend of his father's. And he thinks that must be the Sandman. Well, then something happens and... Nathaniel goes into the room and he sees his father and this guy and they're working on this weird thing and this all of a sudden the father's friend sees that Nathaniel is there watching them and he says oh I, I know I, I've got the perfect eyes now I'll just take you know Nathaniel's eyes and we can use it here so anyway he doesn't really take Nathaniel's eyes but obviously that's traumatizing for Nathaniel and then later on something is going on again between Nathaniel's father and this guy and there was an explosion and Nathaniel's father dies and he goes in and finds his father's charred remains again associating something evil with this friend of his father's and so he grows up he falls in love with somebody named Clara but he can't ever shake this you know haunting within him this idea of the Sandman and that he's doomed because of the Sandman and a whole bunch of other stuff happens with some animatrons and questions about what's real and what isn't um how can we know for sure that somebody is real I don't know it's a lot of stuff I don't know I, I haven't even rated it yet I don't know I probably didn't explain it well but really just go into it for yourself this is so creepy. I definitely feel like I could be in uh, The Same Man by E.T.A. Hoffman. Definitely uncanny here. Anyway, A Short Stay in Hell is a book that definitely raises questions about the meaning of life. It's very existentialist in nature. 
it's an interesting take on hell um, because we have our main character who is a Mormon and when he dies he finds out that he believed the wrong uh, religion or he was a part of the wrong religion and instead the true religion is Zoroastrianism which is an actual religion that does uh, predate Christianity. But at any rate, his task in order to be able to get out of hell is to find the book in this almost infinite library filled with books, books that every book that has been written, every book that could be written, and from all kinds of different perspectives. So even his own life could be written not only from his perspective, but from someone who loved him, someone who hated him. So you kind of get the gist. It's this almost impossible task for him to find this book. But while he's in hell, he does encounter other people. He builds friendships. He builds romantic relationships. All the time, the question stays there, though. What is the meaning of all of this? What is the meaning of life? And... This one is kind of hard to explain to you. I did give it four stars and I will probably read it again at some point because I feel like I kind of had to rush through it because I wanted to finish so I could close out the week of weird. But it is one that I would like to pick up again and be able to devote more time to. So if you have followed this vlog and you're still following with my very creepy kind of face here, thank you. Uh, thank you to Crystal at Fiber Artsy and Jason at Jason's Weird Reads for putting on the week of weird. I have enjoyed it and look forward to doing it again. Thank you to all of you. I hope you will hit that like button, subscribe, and hit that bell so you'll never miss another video from me. Bye!